Um, the idea, the general question, there are several questions when you say, what is consciousness, right? To, a, to an anesthesiologist or a neurologist, he's talking about coma versus consciousness as a scale. And I think that's just the power supply. It's coming from the brain's time and different levels of arousal and, and being conscious or not conscious. And that, that's not going to get you anywhere looking at those systems and understanding consciousness. In understanding the logic of consciousness, which is what we want to understand. It's like saying you need the Krebs cycle for genetics. Obviously you do. But that's not the key to understanding genetics. It's the double helical um, structure of the DNA molecule. So let's forget about that. Okay? Now, what are the other questions concerning consciousness? There are two important questions related. One is what we call qualia. Christoph Koch and Francis Crick have championed this view. And uh, philosophers refer to this as qualia. It just means sensations you're conscious of. So I poke you with a needle. It's not just that you say, ow. Okay? There is also an internal subjective experience of consciously being conscious of pain. If I poke somebody else with a needle, I can describe all the pathways, everything that's active, the cascade of chemicals, neural activity coming to the Broca's area and you say, ow, right? But I don't experience anything. And you don't, there's no reason for you to postulate that that person is internally experiencing a mental phenomenon called qualia. But Skinner you, would say that. Wouldn't you, um, given what you just said about mirror neurons... Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, okay. Right. So what I would argue is when I poke you with a needle, that's a very important question. When I, when I poke myself with a needle, if I look at myself with an auto-cerebroscope 500 years from now, and I plot the diagram and I say all of these things are going on, but, my God, it leaves something out, namely the internal subjective experience, right? Or if you're a Martian looking at my brain, and let's say you don't have any qualia. Or forget about Martian, let's say you're Roger Bingham, and you're born colorblind, and you don't have any color qualia. Okay? But you're intelligent, and you learn physics, you know different wavelengths, and you know other creatures like me, like Rama, other human beings, do have the pigments in the eye, and do have color neurons firing away, and you show me this diagram and say, look, Rama, I know everything about color vision, all of the pathways are firing away. And I say, Roger, but you're missing something. And that's the crucial subjective experience of green, when my green neurons fire, but not red. Subjective experience of red when my red neurons fire, which is ineffable. I cannot communicate it with you. Communicate this feeling to you. So that's a qualia problem. The separate problem, which many people have thought of as a separate problem, and I don't think it is, and that is the problem of self. The person who experiences the qualia. I can reflect on my qualia. You know, I can say, not only do I experience qualia, but I know that I experience qualia, and I know that I experience qualia. So there's a subjective experience of myself experiencing qualia. There is this peculiar solipsistic quality to it. And Crick and Koch have argued, first let's solve the qualia problem, and let's get to the self problem later. And I'm saying that's impossible, with all due respect to Francis and Koch, who have made enormous strides in getting people excited about this. I'm, not, I'm saying there is no earlier stage called qualia and subsequent stage, self-inspecting the qualia. There's no such thing. And the reason is very simple. There's no such thing as free-floating qualia. It's an oxymoron without a self experiencing it. Mm. Likewise, a self without qualia, without any sensations, memories, subjective sensations, is meaningless. So I claim that these two co-evolved in evolution and it's intimately linked to language in the, in the Wernicke's area. So let me be more specific. For qualia to have any meaning at all, there has to be meaning. There has to be... So, for example, when um, a fruit fly sticks out its proboscis looking at a red apple, okay, so let's assume it has color vision. It probably doesn't, but let's assume it looks at the red apple. It's almost a reflex of it. Obviously, it's creating a representation of the apple. It has to because it's neural signals. It's not copying the apple. But then, after the representation comes the tongue or the proboscis flicking at the apple. Okay? And then it consumes parts of the apple. This is a caricature, actually, because they probably do it for smell. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, the visual impulse goes in and they stick out the proposals. I claim it has no qualia. Okay? And there's no point in saying it has a raw awareness of the sensation of red or apple. It doesn't. For you, on the other hand, the apple evokes tempting Eve, baking an apple pie, keeping the doctor away, eating. It's got a thousands, in fact, virtually infinite. Or if you're Newton, hey, it's falling. Makes you think of gravity. Maybe that's what holds the solar system in place. Mm -hmm. So the implications are potentially infinite. And this is uniquely human. 
And this occurs, and I think it's a set of circuits in the brain. Another point I would disagree with is the notion that there are neurons, qualia neurons, or conscious neurons. Crick says this playfully, just to be provocative. But some people take it seriously. I don't think there's any such thing. I think that when you're doing reductionism, there's the appropriate level of reductionism and the inappropriate level. So, for example, when Crick talked about the reductionist basis of genetics and heredity, and Watson and Crick talked about this, the correct level was, it turned out, they were lucky, was the DNA molecule, the double helical structure, and the genetic code. If they have studied quantum mechanics and tried to discover the genetic code at the level of quantum mechanics, they would have failed. So similarly, to understand consciousness and qualia, I don't think you're going to understand it at the level of single neurons. You're going to understand it at the level of circuitry in the brain. But I don't think this is the entire brain. That's important. It's not the activity of the entire brain. It's specific, fairly circumscribed structures. Okay, and what are those structures? So that allows you to home in on the problem. And I think you need to understand the problem of self and the problem of qualia, and the two sides of a Mobius strip, you, or a coin. You cannot understand one without simultaneously understanding other. And this is where people have been led astray, thinking the self is some complicated other problem. Let's, wallet, let's solve qualia first, eventually we'll get to the problem of self. And I think you need to solve them, tackle them simultaneously, and need to map it on, map on the functional logic of consciousness, self, qualia, meaning, right? What do you, how do neurons instantiate meaning? That's the holy, holy grail of neuroscience. And I don't think lower animals, even monkeys do that to the same extent. You may see some rudiments of, of this in great apes. I think it required the emergence of the supramarginal gyrus, which, is, which became the angular gyrus and, the, uh, and another structure in the human brain. Sorry, scratch that. The inferior parietal lobule, which split into angular gyrus and supramarginal gyrus in humans. Right? So that's unique to humans. And an enormous angular gyrus, which is also unique to humans. The Wernicke's area, which is unique to humans, and certain other structures, acting conjointly to generate your sense of self, okay, especially the right hemisphere being involved in body image, sense of a self being anchored in your body, the sense of planning for the future, involving partly the anterior cingulate and the frontal lobe, and the self being able to inspect the sensory in information that's coming in. Now, this, this is dangerous territory, because when you say inspect, makes you think of the homunculus fallacy. There's mm -hmm. a little person watching. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying at some stage in evolution, instead of just sensory representation, you started creating what are called meta-representation. A representation of the representation, unlike the fruit fly, which allows you to manipulate symbols internally in your head. And this is intimately linked to things like meaning. And this is created in the uh, inferior parietal lobule in conjunction with the Wernicke's area, to some extent, it also linked to the sense of agency, which is there in the anterior cingulate. And all of this acting in conjunction, there's the emergence of this dual property of qualia and self, which I think is unique to humans.